evening, everybody. It's good to see all of you. So glad that you are here tonight with us at the fellowship. I want to say along with Pastor Oren that it's great to have you. I hope that you will just make yourself at home and let God do something really great in your heart tonight. It, this is a very special night. It's for, First of all, it's first Wednesday, and uh, we love to do special things on the first Wednesday of each month. And, uh, but it's, it's extra special tonight because this is the night that we are deeming Soul Health Night. And uh, how many of you know that we are living in a world right now, but especially a country where there is so much str distress going on in people's minds? So much more people on anti-anxiety medications, anti-depressing, uh, depression medications right now than any time that I ever remember in all the years of, of doing ministry. And there's nothing wrong with any of that, but the fact that it's increased that much there's, it, it is, is startling to me, and I don't think that that's God's will. And so I want to make sure as a pastor of this church that you and I are walking in a place of health in our souls, in our emotions, in our wills, in our thought processes, our philosophies about life and about God. And so I like to bring people in that know a lot more about that than I do. And uh, you enjoyed uh, Dr. Robert Pace, who was with us last year on our Soul Health Night. And then tonight, uh, I have another very good friend of mine. Uh, we've been doing ministry together remotely for about 18 years. We've been talking on the phone a lot. And a lot of our staff has gone to see her. Um, she has, I, I told her between her and Dr. Pace, I think God has saved our whole staff uh, at one time or another from, from uh, just uh, crashing and burning under heavy circumstances. But uh, tonight actually is the first night I've ever got to meet her face to face because our whole relationship's been on the phone. And so I am, I am so honored tonight, and I'm asking you to give a very warm fellowship welcome to Miss Vicki Junk, counselor and basic miracle worker for people as Jesus uses her to touch a lot of lives. Vicki, please make yourself at home. that worship that worship was amazing <laughs> yeah yeah to love to love God and to show love to God like that mm. um, when pastor and I were talking and like he said he said I asked him you know what do you see in your church that you need and and he talked about the increase of depression and the increase of anxiety and all of that and I said, oh, good, that's a great topic because it's just, we're just seeing that in our offices and we're seeing it throughout the country. You guys are just fitting right into the normalcy. Um, so I, I was thinking, how do I do this? Do I take some narrow, small place and really teach it hard or do I take the big picture? And I decided, let's start with the big picture. And hopefully, as I do the big picture, you're going to end up with more questions than answers. If you leave here and going, oh, the whole purpose tonight is to get you thinking, to get you looking at yourself, to asking the questions, to trying to figure out what's going on. When people come into my office, I tend to see it like a puzzle. I'm just a puzzle, puzzle solver person. And when they come into my office, here's this blank slate. And I compare it to a jigsaw puzzle. Do we have the... The slide of the jigsaw puzzle okay if you can get that up that would be wonderful well that looks a little different than what I said but that works okay <laughs> um, yeah okay so a jigsaw puzzle now if you think of a jigsaw puzzle there's lots of different pieces right and all the pictures are different for different jigsaw puzzles. Some jigsaw puzzles have more blue pieces some jigsaw puzzles have more green pieces what I'm hoping you do tonight is you'll look at yourself like a jigsaw puzzle that you're trying to solve. And some of your pieces will look 
more like one of these five. And some of your pieces will be more physical. Some will be more situational. Everything's going to be different. This is to get you thinking, okay? So let's go through the first one. As we're looking, let's look at each one, the emotional. Now, remember, I'm just doing a big, broad stroke here. But the first thing you need to know about emotions is they are never good or bad in God's eyes. They may feel good. They may feel bad. But in his eyes, they're just feelings. Now, what you do with them, what you ponder on, what you say, that may be good or bad in God's eyes. But God made us emotional creatures. That's who we are. You don't need to feel bad for feeling depression or anxiety. God is full of emotions. Jesus was full of anxiety the night before the cross. That's who we are. God created us that way for a reason, so we can connect emotionally with him. But there's a whole gamut of feelings, and don't feel bad if sometimes you are low and sometimes you are anxious. That's the way we were created. So what kind of feelings do we have? Well, I have a list in my office. It's five columns long and single space, so we're not going to go through the whole list, but I'm going to talk about some of the most common. There's hurt, and there's sad not listened to, unimportant, powerless, that's a big one, but the biggie of the biggies, rejected, rejected, not wanted, pushed aside, unloved, because we're made to be loved and want to be loved. I have never had a person come in my office dealing with depression who wasn't dealing with some level of rejection. Okay, anger. Now, lots of reasons for anger. We can be tired. We can be physically sick. We can be stressed. It can be the person in front of us isn't driving slower than we want to go. But there's also what they call secondary anger. Have you all heard of secondary anger? Okay. Secondary anger is when there's a primary emotion that's fueling that, that you're not looking at. Maybe you were hurt. Maybe you felt powerless. Maybe you felt not listened to. But you don't want to feel it. I mean, who likes to feel bad, right? Okay? You don't want to feel it. But the energy is still there. So the energy comes up. Anger lets you feel strong rather than weak in your feelings. Anger lets you look out at that other person rather than having to look inside at your own stuff. There are two ways to deal with pain, and I bet all of you know that in this room. You face it or you avoid it. Now, the way God made feelings to heal in the body, it actually comes out of the mouth. It can be talking. It can be crying. It can be sighing. They say deep sighs from the depths of your soul is very healing. And you know what else is healing? Laughter. If you're feeling emotions and it comes out of your mouth, that's also very healing. The body is always trying to heal. It's always trying to bring your feelings up out of your mouth. But if you don't want to look at it, if you don't like to feel bad, if you'd rather put it over here and you look this way, guess what, though? The body's still trying to bring it up. And that can create what are called trigger points. You know, I get somebody will say to me, they pushed my buttons. And I just say, well, that just means you got buttons to push. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Trigger points means you've already got these emotions inside of you. Now, let's say it's an emotion of not listened to. Maybe you spent life with a dad who he said children are to be seen and not heard. All right? Shut your mouth. I don't want to hear what you have to say. And it's just irritating the fire with you, and it builds up, and it's built inside. You weren't allowed to express it. Now you get with someone. Maybe you're eating out to dinner, and they're kind of tired, and they're kind of looking out the window while you're trying to talk. All right, you'd feel not listened to. Anybody would, right? Your response, if you didn't have this inside of you already, this trigger point already inside of you, would be, okay, what are you, what's going on here? Come back to me. Let's, let's talk. But instead, what's your response? Well, oh, my gosh. You just don't even care, do you? You're off looking over there, and I'm trying to talk. Now, how important am I in your life, Right? Because guess what happened? That little bit of feeling not listened to triggered that big bit of feeling not listened to, and here it comes. Now, how do you know if it matches the situation or if it's a trigger point? Well, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have to listen to other people, and they'll say, you know, that was a little over the top. That wasn't that big of a deal. Why were you acting like that? Listen to what other people tell you. Okay, so 
it's important that you look at what's inside of you. You're not going to ever heal from the emotions inside unless you look at them and let them come out of your mouth. Keeping them out of your awareness is not the same of them not being there. All right. So the lesson when we're talking about emotions is, number one, it's okay to feel bad. Do you hear that? It's okay to feel bad because it's truth, and it brings healing, and it's better for relationships. You know, the Bible talks a lot about feeling bad. You know, things like take up your cross and follow Jesus. The uh, path is hard. The gate is narrow, right? That leads to life. It's okay to feel bad because here's the irony. Feeling bad leads to feeling good. It can be emotional healing if you're willing to face it. It can be, I'm going to work hard or go to school and do the stuff that feels bad so that I can have a good job and a comfortable life. It can be, I'm going to feel bad and follow Jesus so eventually I have eternity. But don't be afraid of pain. Fear is never from God. Don't be afraid of it. Just welcome it. Okay, that's the first one. Now we're going to talk about the mental pieces. Okay, mental, what does that mean? Well, that's our thoughts and our beliefs. And they can be true thoughts or they can be false beliefs. I have a question for you guys. Where do thoughts come from? When I ask that question, I usually get a blank look, okay? Most people don't think about it. We just think. We don't think about, well, where is it coming from? Well, there's three places. One, primarily, is from yourself. Okay, it can be a thought that's matching what's going on in the moment. Or guess what? We talk about those memories stored inside that you didn't want to remember, didn't want to feel. Well, you didn't only have feelings. You had thoughts. And those thoughts are inside still thinking until you look at them and heal from them. So let's say, let's say somebody really was treating you mean at school. And one day you gave yourself a vow, I'm never going to let anybody talk to me like that again. Mm-hmm. Anybody in here know what I'm talking about? <laughs> All right. So now you're a Christian. You're trying to live this nice Christian life and show Jesus' love, right? And somebody gets a little sharp with you. And your response is, and then you later go, why did I do that? Because it got triggered, that inner vow you made. Or maybe it was just an inner statement. Somebody said to you, maybe, somebody said, you're never going to amount to anything. And now you start thinking inside, unless you're looking at it, it's out of your awareness. Just because you don't pay attention to it doesn't mean it's not there. But you start thinking, I can't do that. Oh, that job's too hard. I can't do that. Why work? I'm never going to be anything. And so it's important to look inside the soul. Okay, that's number one, where thoughts come from. Number two is from God. Bible says the Holy Spirit guides its children. I'll get into that more when we get into the spiritual pieces, but that's number two. All right, number three, demons. Knowing the kind of church you have, I assume you guys believe in them, but let me tell you, they are real. Okay? Um, they don't usually manifest around someone who knows Jesus because they're actually more powerful if they just throw thoughts at you. Ephesians 6 calls them flaming arrows. And these thoughts, these thoughts are not going to, they're always going to be, on some level, they're going to be false. They're going to be delusional. They're not going to match truth. He's trying to give destruction to your life, and that's his whole plan. Okay, so what kind of thoughts can there be? Well, I don't have time to go into all of that. This is one of these things I could spend a couple of hours talking about. But let's talk about some of the common ones. When we're talking about depression and anxiety, you very often I'll have people that are cutters or burners or have suicidal ideation. Now, I have come to believe totally that whenever a person is struggling with that kind of thoughts, it's always demonic. Okay, here's why. It's not God, okay? Okay. Your body is the temple of God. He wants you to take care of it. And as humans, as animals, except that we're different than them because, you know, God's spirit can dwell in us. It makes us quite a bit different, actually. But 
We have natural instincts of survival. Humans will go to very great lengths to stay alive, be kept alive, to be kept safe. Natural instincts of survival. I believe those destructive thoughts to hurt yourself are not from yourself. And when you start becoming aware of where are my thoughts coming from, then you can take a stand against it. Um, delusion. If you believe something about yourself that does not match reality, I mean, if you think you were a king of some country or born on Venus and your birth certificate doesn't say that, okay, <laughs> that's, that's not truth. And I don't believe that comes from you. Now, I will say this. There certainly can be diseases of the brain that can cause weird thinking and all of that. That's part of the jigsaw puzzle, too. But... But I think a lot of it is a lot more from the spiritual than we give it credit for. Yeah. So how do we do spiritual warfare? Well, there's really three ways. One, of course, is you cast them out. But even though that's the dramatic way, I think that's the, the least effective way. Now, there's a time and place for it. I don't want you to hear there isn't. There is definitely a time and place for it. But another way is prayer. You know, Jesus gave us the perfect prayer in the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer is a daily prayer. It says, give us this day our daily bread, okay? And that means in our daily prayer, we're to incorporate something that says, and deliver us from evil. Pray over yourself. Pray over everybody and your spiritual authority. Pray over your home. Pray for God's protection. You have no power over it, but Jesus has power over all of them. Just like that, he can get rid of them. And then the third way, which I think is really the most effective, it says in James, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. But here's the thing. If there's any area in your life that you're saying no to God, you're opening the door for the devil to throw thoughts at you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that clapping because I think that's the most important point, right? All right, yeah, yeah. Okay, you can give room for the devil to work because he knows this is an area you're not going to put yourself quite under what God is saying. So he'll give you thoughts of pleasure or of fear, but he'll try and make you go that direction. Okay, so here's some healthy self-talk for you. Oh, well, so what? <laughs> How often do you get upset and it's really no big deal? Here's another one. It hurts, but it's okay to hurt. Or, will this be important tomorrow or next week or when I die and meet Jesus? How is he going to want to see it? What we're talking about there is the big picture. Think about the big picture, what you're saying and doing and how it affects the big picture. You know, in Genesis, 50 times it says, and it came to pass. Time goes on. Think of the big picture. It's more than me, and it's more than now. Okay. Putting your jigsaw puzzle together and looking off the pieces and have some questions in your head. Let's move to the third category, situational. Situation, situational has to do with things outside of yourself. We are not isolated beings, okay? We have responses. We have responses emotionally. We have responses in our thinking. We have physiological responses in our body to what's around us. What's around us could be our relationships, a marriage, a family, friendships. It could be the media. It could be the news. It could be a lot of things. But what is going on in your environment? Because in order to heal internally, you have to also look at the external. So here's some facts. Your environment won't always be supportive. Another one, your relationships and families won't always be healthy. Three, the internet is not always a friendly place. Four, there are stressors in society, like pandemics and wars. And five, the news is 95% negative. That's the environment we're living in, okay? So it's important to have good boundaries. That's real important. It takes boundaries to be godly, and it takes boundaries to be emotionally healthy. Say no to some of that stuff. There is what they call vicarious trauma. Have you ever heard that term? You know what the word vicarious means? It means you're experiencing something from some, through somebody else. Maybe there was a mom, and she wanted to be a ballet dancer. 
and she didn't get to be. So she's pushing her child who doesn't care about ballet, but come on, push. You got to be a ballet dancer. She's living, trying to live vicariously through her. Vicarious trauma means I'm not actually experiencing the event, but I am now being traumatized by it. After 9-11, any counselor will tell you, we started getting people coming in our office who were dealing with anxiety. Why? Because they had that news on all day long. And they see the building explode, and they see people jump out of the windows, and they would see the smoke and the terror and the faces and the people crying. And it just got them so that they were vicariously traumatized. Um, another thing I want to talk about here is how children respond to the media. And please hear me on this. Children are more easily traumatized than adults are. That's true in any general situation, not just the media. But I, I've, I've had too often, where a parent would bring a child in who was dealing with anxiety, and as we do the feelings and the memory work, and what's coming forward is an image they saw on that television set or in the news that stuck with them and scared them. And the parents are going, well, that wasn't that big deal. Well, no, as an adult, it wasn't. I remember as a kid seeing on TV, because I'm this old, they had The Wizard of Oz on TV. And I saw that Wicked Witch, and I never wanted to see that movie again. Now, what are the adults doing? Oh, look at her makeup. Oh, she's a great actress. Why do kids get so scared? Well, what professionals theorize is, is that kids don't differentiate between fantasy and reality like adults do. Another thing is kids naturally feel less powerful than adults, and they are less powerful than adults. Uh, they're probably in also a more formative stage of life, but they do get scared. And so, you know, PG-13 ratings, that wasn't devised by Christians who wanted to keep their kids protected from this awful stuff. This was by secular psychologists who understood those kids do not see those movies the same way. Keep your kids away from them. Otherwise, they're going to grow up as an adult, and they're going to have these scary memories in them, and that's not going to help them at all. Okay? So the lesson there is boundaries. Spend time in relaxing environments. Okay. We're moving on. Physical. How a body feels physically affects how you feel emotionally. How your body feels physically is how you feel emotionally. Fatigue, hormones, chemicals such as uh, neurotransmitters in the brain, adrenaline, cortisol, that kind of thing, PMS, menopause. I had a professor when I was in graduate school, and she made a statement. I think there's a lot to this. She said, I think, in her opinion, she said, I think before anyone is put on any type of psychotropic medication, especially long term, that they should first have a complete physical. Make sure it isn't something else, their thyroid or whatever is going on. Because your body, if there's physically something wrong, it can affect how you're feeling emotionally. Um, let's talk about those antidepressants for a little bit, okay? Because we're seeing an awful lot of use of this. Antidepressants are geared to specifically influence a certain chemical in your body, depending what medication you are on. Maybe it's serotonin or something like that. If what you're experiencing is because of that chemical imbalance, that medication is going to do wonders. It will be great. If what you're experiencing is not because of that, it's not going to work. Although what is common, and this is very common, your personal jigsaw puzzle has a lot of pieces. And in the middle of a chaotic jigsaw puzzle, that can affect your body phys physically. It can throw off your neurotransmitters, your hormones, that kind of thing. And then those medications can at least alleviate that piece of your jigsaw puzzle. And in other words, it kind of can take the edge off a little bit of what you're feeling. Okay. Now I have another one. This one I'm going to make a soapbox. This is about food. And I'm not talking about nutrition, although good nutrition is certainly important because how your body feels physically is how you feel emotionally. I'm obviously not a health food nut. <laughs> but this one comes because I have had personal experience with it. When I was in graduate school, I started developing anxiety. Now, I'm very blessed. I'm just not a person who's anxious. I don't worry. I keep away from scary movies. 
I just leave it to God. I'm fine. But I'm feeling this anxiety. It would come and go on and off. What in the world is going on here? Well, all right, I'm in grad school, and I'm a single mom, and I'm dealing with a chronic illness at the time. Yeah, there's a little bit of stress in my life. You would think that's it, but this seems weird. And as I started researching the illness I was dealing with and some other things, I read where it could be allergies. So being the puzzle solver that I am, I went to an allergist, and he said, well, you're not allergic to anything except one thing, corn. Corn? Hey, guys, I was born and raised in Iowa. This is corn country, okay? It's my favorite vegetable. Do not tell me I'm allergic to corn. So guess what I did? I came right home and fixed me a big pile of corn to eat. Let's see what happens here. Yeah, no hives, no rashes. But in about 15 minutes, I started feeling a little bit on edge. And then as time went on, I started getting more on edge. And then I got really on edge and my thinking became cloudy. And then after three and a half hours, I thought I was just going to, ah, scream. And then it stopped. Well, that's interesting. Let's see if we can do that again. So eat more corn. Same thing all over again. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I played with it some more. Hey, I could eat some corn chips. I could eat popcorn. But if it had corn syrup anywhere in that label, all over again. All right, so I'm a believer. Well, my daughter, who's now fully growing up, but she, when she was in elementary school, she went bouts of all this emotionality. Wouldn't match the situation, crying. Now, she's gone through some tough stuff in her life. I will say that. So I'm thinking this is the emotional piece of the jigsaw puzzle, right? Let me love her, help her out, that kind of thing. But now I had an understanding, well, let's look at everything. Let's look at all of the pieces in the jigsaw puzzle, not just the emotional pieces. So I'm starting to watch, and when she would eat sugar, she would get like this. I can eat sugar. Obviously, I eat a lot of it. I'm fine. And you get a little more energy, but okay. So I, I went down to the Moody Medical Library. I thought, let's research this. That's my style. And they're saying, no, it doesn't affect it. But here's the thing about research. They go by norms. They go by statistics. Let's say, I'm just pulling a number out of the hat, but let's say 97% of people are not affected like that by sugar. But what about the 3%? So then I went to the Clear Lake Library and started researching it, and oh my gosh, there was tons of anecdotal stories by individual doctors talking about this. And here's some of the things I found out. It can be any food, but the most, most common are corn, sugar, wheat, and milk. An intolerance is different than an allergy, and so if you have an, an allergy or intolerance, either one can cause it, but if it's a food intolerance, it's not going to show up on an allergy test. If it's a problem food, you're probably also going to crave it. And if you go off of the food, you're going to go through withdrawal. So I first took my daughter into the doctor. I said, I want to make sure she's not diabetic or hyperglycemic, and she wasn't. So I sat her down in sixth grade. I said, we're going to do an experiment. I said, uh, um, we're going to take you off. If it says anything in the label, sugar, dextrose, sucrose, glucose, you're not having it. But I put a bunch of sugar-free popsicles and sugar-free Kool-Aid in the refrigerator. Eat all you want. Well, she got worse, like they said. But in four days, suddenly she was fine. Now, here's the cool thing. Okay, my daughter, growing up in elementary school, remember this was sixth grade when we did this. Our rule in our house was Saturday morning, you have to clean your room before you go out and play or get on the phone. And I don't care if you clean it during the week and it's an easy job. I don't care if it gets three feet deep. But Saturday morning, you are going to clean. And every Saturday morning, I am telling you, it was tears. It was crying. I don't know how to do this, Mom. What? You just take a piece, put it away. Take a piece, put I don't know how to do this. This is too hard. You know, when we took her off sugar that week, the very next Saturday, five minutes, she comes out of her room. I'm done. I went to her room. It was spotless. And we never had trouble a Saturday morning again. Yeah. I've heard other stories. I obviously don't have time for them. But just keep that in mind. 
if you are experiencing on and off anxiety or whatever, what have I had to eat the last few hours? One thing the literature was saying, what makes it hard is you don't know how long it's going to last or how long withdrawal is going to be. Average withdrawal is four days. Average amount of time is three or four hours, but it can vary widely. I happened, as I experimented, I found out paprika does it to me. A friend of mine said they found out olives does it to them. I don't know. You just kind of have to play it by ear. Maybe see us allergists, but again, that may not be everything. Okay, we're on the last one now. Spiritual. Like we said, there are two sides to the spiritual realm. One side loves Jesus. One side hates Jesus. Christians in the English language, we call them angels and we call them demons. We've already discussed demons throwing thoughts at you, but there's something else I want to briefly discuss, and that is generational depression and anxiety. Um, when we talk about generational depression, somebody will say, my parents had it, my, their parents had it, their, you know, you'll see a theme go through. The big debate in the professional world is, is it the environment they were raised in? Was it the feelings they grew up around and then they picked up and reflected those feelings? Is there anything genetic? That's up for debate. But something I want to add to the jigsaw puzzle is Exodus 20 says the iniquities of the fathers will pass to the third and fourth generation. I had a pastor tell me, and I really agree with this. He said, if you have a person who's been into some sort of evil stuff and they die, the demons don't die. And so they just pass on through to the generation. Um, when I have people in my office, if I have somebody where the demons are actually fully manifesting, where they can see and hear them, a high, high percentage of those people come from American Indian background with the Indian witchcraft. So it's interesting because God told the Jews, renounce your sins and renounce the sins of your ancestors. And I think we're supposed to do that. And I just lead people through a, a, something like this. And it's very easy. I, I don't want people to focus on the demons. We're supposed to focus on God. But on the other hand, the Bible does tell us and explain to us there's an enemy and be aware of him. But they would say something like, I renounce my sins. I renounce the sins of my ancestors. I break in any all ties I have with Satan, any that I may have caused, any that may have been caused against me, and any that may have come down through the generations. In the name of Jesus, I command all demons to leave, go to no one in my family, and never return. Now, here's the warning. Do not fool with the demonic if you're not in a yes position with Jesus. Or you end up one of, like one of the seven sons of Siva in the book of Acts. Okay. All right. Part of spiritual. I'm getting to my favorite part now. All right. This is the Holy Spirit. Mm. Holy Spirit is the comforter, right? But he can't comfort what you don't give him. Jesus is the healer. But if you're keeping something down in darkness, Jesus doesn't work in darkness. You have to go to it and bring it up where he's in the light. Or you go to it with Jesus and bring the light into it. But Jesus, it, it, can't, it has to be seen by you. You have to deal with it. Also, a central principle in the Christian faith. We talk about love. We talk about obedience. But I think there's another one we often fail to talk about, and that is truth. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. Jesus said in John 8, 32, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Yeah. Yeah. Psalm 51, 6 says that God desires truth in the inward parts, in your inner being. You're even just supposed to be in truth within your soul. The church is called the bulwark of truth. First Peter in chapter 1 says, you purify your souls by obedience to the truth. So come to God completely in truth. And here's one of my favorite things to do. This is the part that I enjoy talking about. I love to lay on my bed in full truth, all my feelings, all my heart, in a fully yes position, and talk to God. And as you do, he envelops you, and you're in the spirit, and it's very warm. I love to bask in the warmth of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I just lay there. Sometimes I have questions. Even in my pain, I can feel the warmth of his spirit at the same time. But in my pain, 
I, I, I see it differently. First of all, it's okay to have pain. Second of all, it is balanced by the warmth. And third of all, I see it like God sees it. And he says, well, I, I, this is a painful world that I've given, but it's okay. And it's very comforting. And in that place of great, great intimacy, which is what God made us for, this is what he wants. Give up everything else and go for him. And in that place of intimacy, sometimes he'll talk back. He'll, sometimes if I have questions, he'll answer it. A number of times he's given me prophecies, and then when they come true, it really increases my faith even more. But that intimate intimate place don't go for the things of the world don't go for your pride don't avoid pain and truth just do what the bible says and i promise you the fruit of the spirit is what love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control but too often people go for the fruit more than they go for the spirit now that's fine go with the fruit okay but you go for the spirit and he's the one who creates that and I have a friend, and I'm going to end on this because I think this is a great thought. She said, my life is a mess and it's horrible. But when I'm in the spirit, it feels wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy looking at your jigsaw puzzle. Would you just stand with me? tonight you know Jesus paid an enormous price the greatest price to redeem us and redemption means to to bring back to buy back and he did that in all three aspects of who we are uh, all five of these situations but our our bodies our souls our spirits Jesus doesn't want Satan to have access to any of it he's not satisfied for us to oh you know I'm 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 God's in in these two areas but but you know I just grown to live that Satan gets to have his way in the other area that no no, he wants to be Lord of all. God wants all of us. And he wants us to be healthy and have not just life, but have abundant life. Life and that abundantly. He wants you to be healthy physically. He wants you to be, uh, uh, the scripture says above all things that, that you would be in health at, even as your soul prospers. He wants your soul to prosper. He wants you to be healthy emotionally, healthy uh, 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 thoughtfully, healthy in your decision making. And he wants you to have a healthy spirit, that, that, that his spirit and your spirit commune daily, like Vicki was saying when she just lays out and just basks in the presence of God. He wants you to have those moments regularly. And, and for you to think that you have to put up with any kind of torment, I'm not saying the tor moments of torment won't come. Pain's going to happen. You heard her say that. The enemy's going to fire darts at you. You're going to have days when he launches assignments against you because of the magnitude of God's call on your life and the beauty of the relationship and who, he, who you are in Christ. You're going to have those moments, but you don't have to put up with them lasting perpetually. God, God wants us to, to have the joy and the, and the peace and the righteousness that comes with the kingdom. And so tonight, I hope that you're receiving this word that Vicki has given us, that God wants health for our souls. But it doesn't come automatically. We got to go after it. If, if my father has taught us one thing over all the years of my life growing up under his ministry is that the things of God must be appropriated. That there are too many Christians that just live adjacent to the blessing of God because they've believed some kind of lie that may, that's good for everybody else, but maybe, maybe it wasn't for me. But no, God loves it. 
when, it, when, his, when his people go after his promises. You know, the scripture says that, that we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, uh, expect for anybody else to, uh, we shouldn't expect things from each other. And a lot of people think that because Jesus said that, that that applied to God as well. But that doesn't apply to God. God said, expect from me. Chase me. Ask of me. If you ask, you'll receive. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, the door will be open unto you. And then if it wasn't good enough that he said it one time, he repeated himself and said, for he who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and he who knocks, to him the door will be open." Because God is, is excited by our faith when we pursue Him, when we, when we reach out to appropriate the things that, that His Son paid such a great price to secure for us. And so this is what I want us to do before we leave, if, you, if you'll just do this with me. I, I don't ever like us to leave without having a moment to, to have some type of emotional, physical response to the Word of God. And so as Josh and the team just kind of leads us back into worship, if this, if this is registered with you tonight and you're sensing that in one of these situations, maybe you've allowed a stronghold of the enemy. Maybe you've allowed a stronghold from him in your, in your diet where you're, you're letting food control you in some way or maybe you're letting your emotions control you or maybe there's a thought that keeps plaguing you and, and, and you're not you're not getting past that thought whatever it might be maybe you're having nightmares maybe there's a particular spiritual attack that just is repetitive and it never goes away and you have found out tonight that you have the power to resist it and it has to flee from you if you're submitted to God is there something you haven't submitted to God there's a whole gamut of situations that it could be for you but only you can answer that question. And only you can be honest with yourself and God. So if there's something that you need to give to God tonight, I'm just asking you to step out from where you're standing and come stand down at the front just as a, a step of faith. I know you don't have to. I know this area is not any more holy than where you're standing now. But there's just something about you taking the step of faith that makes it a holy moment. And when you get down here, just start getting real with God. Close your eyes. Just get in your own little personal space, you and Jesus, and start talking to him about what it is that you're ready to give him. What area is it that you're ready to let the Holy Spirit start speaking to and addressing and working on? And while Josh is just leading us back into a little bit of worship, just let Jesus reach down and begin to touch that area of your life right now.
person that has surrendered the issue, the area of our lives where the enemy has been grabbing hold of or has established a foothold. Help us to give those things to you right now, God. Help us to consciously surrender every aspect of our spirits, our souls, and our bodies to you so that we may be whole, not just healed, God, but that we may be whole, wholly integrated into your presence. No division, no splintering, no shredding of anything, God, a whole person. Pray you would help us to decide that we're going to live this way every day. And, and the moment that you shine a light on an issue that is, that is trying to separate us from you in any way, God, that we will be quick to jump on it and to repent and to give it to you so that we will be intolerant of the concept that we would be divided, that we would be double-minded, so that we would be unstable. God, help us to be strong and healed and whole because every day we are giving our all to you. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for a church full of people, Lord. None of us being perfect, God, but, but every day being surrendered to your ways, to your will, to your word, your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Woo! So Jesus loves you, and he's got beautiful things for you. And I'm so thankful that you came tonight. What a great, beautiful crowd on Wednesday night. Thank you for being here. Miss Vicki, thank you so much for being with us tonight. What an amazing word. We love y'all. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you on Sunday.